I haven't spent a lot of time in a courtroom, but I did once. Why are you laughing? <laughs> I, I hope not. <laughs> well, I was there to support a parishioner, and, and he'd gotten himself into some trouble, and he wanted some spiritual support with him. He said, will you come with me? And I think in his mind, too, it didn't hurt to have someone wearing a white collar sitting beside him. And, and it was an interesting experience for me. It wasn't anything like I had expected because all I knew about court came from legal dramas on TV. And, and, and so I was kind of surprised that it was a rather small room, uh, rather austere. I was surprised that there was no jury I don't know why I would think they'd have a jury for some kind of little misdemeanor, whatever he was involved in, I don't even remember. But I do remember that it was more personal than I thought. The, the judge got up there and said, well, what's the issue? And the one lawyer said, well, this is what he's done. And, and then his representative lawyer said, okay, but, you know, he's never had an offense. He's never even had a speeding ticket, and it's his first offense, and he really regrets it. And the, the judge asked some questions, and and then made his verdict at the end. Now, I don't know if you've had a lot of experience in courtrooms. I'm looking at a few of you thinking maybe you have. Uh, But that that was my only experience. I don't know a lot about, about courtrooms. Today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter four, or chapter three, And in Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is bringing us into a courtroom. A courtroom. And some people, this might surprise you, don't like the Apostle Paul. Some people find him harsh. It's important to know as we read the third chapter of Romans that Paul here is assuming the role of a prosecution lawyer. And as we all know, lawyers are not our favorite people. Amen? I wanted to see if anyone would amen so I could tell Fred. He's not here, but he will listen to this. I'm taking down names. So here we enter into this courtroom. And uh, as we stand there watching the proceedings, sort of taking it all in, Paul is making his case against humanity. And his charge, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, you and I might not be too familiar with legal court proceedings, but in Paul's day, it would have been very common for people to be actually quite familiar with legal proceedings. You see, in the first century, most Court cases would take place outside, out in a public space where these things would normally happen. And in small, close-knit communities, before the invention of Netflix, when a case was tried, people would wander down and check out what was going on. I mean, there wasn't a lot to do. Not only did this mean that They knew everybody else's business. It also meant that they were quite familiar with legal language and procedures. So while we might find Paul abrasive, and admittedly he often is, his readers would have understood what he was doing. He was making a case against humanity, and he does so by introducing his first witness, And his first witness is the Hebrew Scriptures. And the Hebrew Scriptures testify against humanity. Paul writes, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is in their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin 
and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is quite a testimony. (laughs) Quite a testimony indeed. Whether Jew or Gentile, Paul argues to the jury, we all have sinned. As he said earlier in the letter, on the day of judgment, we will find ourselves without excuse. There is no one righteous. No, not one. But, but, I mean, come on. I don't like this, Paul. This makes me uncomfortable. Surely, surely there is somebody who is righteous. Surely I am righteous. People get mad when preachers talk about this stuff. They get uncomfortable. How dare you tell us that the world isn't a magical, happy place where everyone is always nice? So, I went to the Toronto Star this week to catch some headlines. Canadian athletes targeted by Russian hackers. That's not the only thing they've targeted lately. Police investigate anti-Semitic incidents in a Toronto condo. Anti-Semitism and other forms of outright racism are on the rise. Building shook as a drug lab explodes in Parkdale. This was Wednesday, I think. Just headlines in the paper. Seniors urged to be vigilant as police report a hike in scams. Mark a man fatally shot overnight. There were three shootings on that one page. I just picked one. And of course... (laughs) Soaring hydro rates in Ontario. The most tragic thing of all. Actually, I had to go to the sun for that. (laughs) The star didn't have anything bad about wind. I don't know why. There is good in the world. There is definitely good in the world. Paul isn't arguing that that human beings aren't capable of kindness or charity or forgiveness, or generosity. What he is saying is that if you look at the world, there's a whole lot of people crying out for justice. The kid walking to school in February through the snow with no winter coat or hat or gloves. And I see it here in Midland. The single mom in Toronto whose husband was shot by a stray bullet. An elderly man abandoned to a hospital bed. The man who self-medicates to chase away the demons of residential schools. The farmer who grows coffee that he cannot afford to drink. The family who makes their home in a garbage dump. And it is also their job. The young girl sold into sex slavery. Do you think that God is deaf to their cries for justice? More to the point, do you want a God who is deaf to their cries for justice? Well, some would say that we should preach only the God of love, the God of forgiveness, the God of mercy. Do we not also want a God of justice? Do we want to worship a God who stands silent in the face of injustice? For me, the answer is no. I want to worship a God who will stand for the poor, for the widow, for the orphan, for the lost stranger. And that is the kind of God that he himself describes himself as being. In Deuteronomy 10 we read, For the Lord your God 
shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. It loves the alien or stranger, giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. What Paul is saying here is that the children of Abraham haven't done that, haven't stood for the fatherless of the widow, haven't loved the alien, neither have the Gentiles. As far as he's concerned, we should stop protesting these charges that are being leveled against humanity. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. In Paul's world, if you were on trial and had nothing more to say for your defense, you would simply put your hand over your mouth as a sign that you were finished speaking. Now, sometimes, if the court officials thought that you were done and you disagreed, they would strike you across the mouth, effectively silencing you. This would indicate that your mouth should probably be stopped. In other words, they were obviously guilty and they should just quit trying to defend themselves. This actually happened to Jesus. You can read about that in John 18. And it happened to Paul, so he knew about it. You read about that in Acts 23. So when Paul says that every mouth should be silenced or stopped, he is imagining not only that the Jews have joined the Gentiles in the dock, but that all of them put together are left without defense. What about the Old Testament law? Would that at least save the Jews? Well, no, Paul says that that's not going to save them. The law only serves to show the children of Abraham how far they are missing the mark, how far they have come from what is just. So, where does that leave us? Where does that leave the world? What do we do now? We need a miracle. As Cindy talked about with the kids. Have you ever watched a TV court drama where things look bleak and there's no hope on the horizon? All seems lost and then suddenly out of nowhere a small piece of information is revealed that changes everything? Maybe they found some video footage or maybe they found the murder weapon or they just figured out this little piece of information that changes the the whole court case. Well, this is what happens here in Paul's letter. Paul turns from bad news to reveal a small piece of information that will change everything. He writes, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but but are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Okay. We need to back up a little bit. This stuff is really deep. Really, really deep. And I'm only going to scratch the surface, but I want to pause here for a second and break this down. Now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been revealed. God is doing a new thing. 
And that's what Paul is talking about. Not that the scriptures don't point to this new thing, but it caught everyone, and I mean everyone, by surprise. God is sending a hero, a savior. He's going to set things right. But let's remember that all have sinned. Everyone, Jew or Gentile, have fallen short. But, but here's the thing, the good news, that humanity is declared just through grace because, because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. The question is, how? How? So let's back up again. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Now, that phrase, faith in Jesus Christ, is two words in Greek, pistis Christu. Pistis Christu. And, and, and pistis Christu is often translated, especially in the NIV, as faith in Jesus Christ. Here's the thing about translating your Bible. It's not a precise science. Although Greek is a very technical language, often you are left to context to translate how things go. You see, uh, pistis Christu is the objective genitive form of translation, meaning faith in. Whereas pistis Christu could also be a subjective genitive which would be translated the faith of Christ. Are you with me? See, based on context, we have to decide, and biblical translators make their decision, does pistis Christu mean faith in Christ or the faith of Christ? Here's another wrinkle in the plan. The word faith can also mean faithfulness. It can be faith or faithfulness, same word, How do you decide? So here's our dilemma as we come to it. Some translators have translated it a little differently. The faith in Christ is translated a little bit differently in the New English translation. They say, namely, through the righteousness of God, through the faithfulness of God, Jesus Christ. Let me back up again, and then I'll bring you to the point. You see, Paul's argument, what he's saying happened is that Christ perfectly kept the law for the first time ever. Finally, a child of Abraham fulfilled the conditions of the Mosaic Covenant. Let's back up again. What's the Mosaic Covenant? All right. There was a covenant with Abraham. What was that one? That I will give you this land and I will give you children beyond counting. Remember that? Land and kids. And then later on to the descendants of Abraham, he made a covenant with Moses. And with Moses, he said, okay, children of Abraham, I'm going to give you the law, and I'm going to bless you. But here's the deal. This is a conditional covenant. The first one with Abraham is unconditional. The second one is conditional. The condition is this. If you do not keep the law... If you do not remain faithful to me, I will remove the blessings and there will be curses. And the children of Abraham shook on it and said, agreed. Agreed. The covenant with Moses was a conditional covenant. There will be blessings or cursings depending upon how you kept the covenant. Question, how well did they keep that covenant? Not well. Not well at all. Half of the Old Testament is the story of how they didn't keep the covenant and God removed his blessings. You have to know all of this to understand Paul's point because this is the testimony of Scripture that he is bringing forth at this point. Finally, the Old Testament talks about a future covenant. And in this future covenant, it will be different than the covenant with Moses. They won't have to go, he says, to go find God because God will be right there. 
And the covenant is not something they'll have to read and study. It'll be on their hearts and their minds. Now, as we read in Hebrews 8, God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. That's the Mosaic covenant. Because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. Abraham, I'm going to give you this land and all these kids. You don't have to do anything. The Mosaic covenant Conditional. I will bless you if you follow my law. They didn't follow the law. God promised a future covenant, one where everyone would follow the law because it would be on their hearts. It enters this little scene. Jesus Christ, shortly before he died, said in the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Are you following me? This is a wide swath of history here at theology. But what we read is this. Christ perfectly kept the law. For the very first time ever, a child of Abraham fulfilled the conditions of the Mosaic covenant. And not only that, but he instituted a new covenant covenant of grace. And then even further than that, because of, he could do that because of the faithfulness of Christ. We who believe will be saved. Now, <laughs> I know that usually when we talk about this stuff, the preacher says, okay, you've sinned, and so you're going to hell. And if you believe in Jesus, and really mean it, you'll go to heaven we are living in a disembodied state in a paradise. And there is some truth to that. But that's not Paul's argument. It's not what he's talking about here. He's got so much more depth to it. And we need to understand it. You see, after three weeks of bad news, all of a sudden a small piece of evidence completely changes the outcome in our favor because Jesus now stands in our place. We can throw ourselves upon the mercy of the court. As Paul writes, God publicly displayed him, that's Jesus, at his death as the mercy seat accessible through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because God in his forbearance had passed over the sins previously committed. This was also to demonstrate his righteousness in the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who lives because of Jesus' faithfulness. And so, the accusation has been made to the jury. We've all sinned. Jew or Gentile, we've all gone astray. None of us have been faithful to the image of God within us, as we talked about two weeks ago, or the covenant of Israel, as we talked about last week. We stand condemned. God is judge, is ready to pound the gavel, guilty. But wait, the judge must stay his hand. Paul presents not only our accusation, but also our defense. There is one, one human hand, one child of Abraham who so perfectly embodied the image of God that he was, in fact, God incarnate, and who perfectly kept the law. Not only that, but he fulfilled the covenant, both Abrahamic and Mosaic and future, and ushered in the promised covenant of grace through his broken body and his shed blood. And that is why we call him Savior, because he saved us. In this courtroom drama, Jesus shows up and, and he takes our place. He, he becomes our representative. 
not only does he, he plead our case for us, but he, he, he actually stands in our place. And not in the way that we often think that, that God is irate at us and took it out on his son, but that Jesus quite literally stands in her place and says, I kept the covenant for them. I am the perfect image of God for them. I was completely faithful. My thoughts were never twisted. My heart was never darkened. My deeds were always righteous. I have heard the cry of my people, and I have come to answer that call. And so, as Paul says, he is both the just and the one who justifies those who believe in him. He hears the cry of those calling out for justice. And he walked, he healed the sick. He drew close to the woman at the well. He drove out demons. He stood for justice. And he stands for justice today. D.M. Stearns was preaching in Philadelphia, as the story goes. At the close of the service, uh, a stranger came up to him and said, I don't like the way you spoke about the cross. He said, I think that instead of emphasizing the death of Christ, it would be far better to preach Jesus the teacher and example. And Stearns replied, if I presented Christ in that way, would you be willing to follow him? I certainly would, said the stranger, without hesitation. All right then, said the preacher, Let's take that first step. He did no sin. Can you say the same for yourself? Well, the man looked confused and somewhat surprised. Why no, he said, I acknowledge that I do sin. Stearns replied, well, then your greatest need is not an example, but a savior. And it's true. So, the scratch is only the surface of Paul's argument. But today we can leave here knowing that if you've forgotten about genitive objective or genitive subjective cases of Pistis Christu, take away at least this that God, He hears the cry of those seeking justice, that He answered that call through his own faithfulness. And then he calls us, his church, to be faithful in return, to imitate him and seek justice as well. Thank God that he saved us because the judge was just about to declare us guilty. We stood condemned, but instead he stood condemned for us. Let's pray.